Amen. Please have a seat. I'm so glad you could come out, and I'm so glad that we could all be together, even electronically. Everything all right? I uh, don't know how long this situation will last because everything's changing, and I don't think we'll ever go back to the uh, older way, but um, I do pray that we could all have um, public gatherings with unlimited number of people. But uh, I got to admit, though, this is a complete reversal because this is the first time in a long time I've worried that too many people would come to church. <laughs> but uh, so the Lord has given us a special blessing here, and he's given us you, and he's given us you out there. Now, I want to uh, talk uh, for a minute about the current situation, as always, and uh, then I want to go to Luke chapter 13. But, you know, it struck me the other day that uh, the things that have happened uh, recently are understood on many levels, okay? For one thing, I mean, there's a legitimate concern by a lot of people that this is uh, anti-Christian and that uh, governments are taking control and there's all kinds of schemes and plots. And believe me, I don't ridicule any of them. You know, the Bible says the kings of the earth and their rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his Christ. And they want to remake the world. And I believe that we may be on the verge of the great reset of everything. I mean, you can't just phase out of a certain economy and then start a new one without some kind of calamity. And I do believe that this plague is the perfect pretext for much, much, much change that I don't think any of us will like. But behind all that, and it's not my purpose to go there because I don't really understand what's all happening or who all is involved or what the factors are, but underneath all that is God. God is working. God is doing something. And Yeah. All right. Thank you for pausing me. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Praise the Lord. Truth and beauty and happiness, all in the name of Jesus. We praise thee, O Lord. Thank you that we can praise and worship and serve you, O God. And fill this room with your praises and your presence, O Lord God. And that you have given the promise to the church. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So Lord, give us insight. Is it all back? All right. Sure, because I don't want that last solo to be uh, going out there. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. All right, yeah, I'll restart. Um, look, there's a lot of things going on. And many of them are very nefarious, I have no doubt. It's not my purpose to try to de delve that t today. I think that there's a lot of uh, unscrupulous people. I think that Satan and the Antichrist and his minions, the kings of the earth and their rulers, have really uh, taken advantage. This plague has served as a perfect pretext for sudden rapid change. You know, you, don't, you can't just change a whole society. Uh, suddenly, unless there's some pre pretext, there's got to be a war or a crash or a plague or something. But I have the feeling we are on the verge of the Great Reset. And one aspect of that Great Reset and reorganization is that I think they're going to get rid of filthy lucre and give us a digital identity and it'll lead to Revelation 13, the mark of the beast. Not my purpose today, but I do want to say that underneath all the machinations of the kings of the earth, the rulers, the schemers, the plotters, and the treacherous dealing treacherously, God is working. And it just occurred to me, and I actually blogged about it uh, recently, that what he's done is allowed everything that's basically made America such a pleasant place, he takes it away. Now look, I don't think sports is wrong. I think it's fantastic. I like sports myself. And usually right now people would be making out their charts for March Madness and they're into college uh, basketball, college wrestling, they into the NBA. And I'm telling you, what the, sports is an idol in this country. And what a huge thing for it just to all shut down like that. And movies and entertainment and 
Even just the simple pleasures like going out to a restaurant and letting someone else pamper you. Gone. And then I, it occurred to me again. Even something so taken for granted like going to a church with a bunch of people that you know and love and worshiping with them even that's being curtailed okay now there are all kinds of reasons why the bad people are doing it i have no doubt the bad guys are working overtime and they're rubbing their hands with glee but deep down inside god's working and what I think he's doing is taking away the bread and circuses. You know the expression bread and circuses? The Roman emperors were really sophisticated, and they knew they'd have restive populations because basically daily life was short, miserable, and brutish for people unless they were super rich. But they would not, they were able to control this restiveness by making a steady stream of free bread and entertainment, the Colosseum, so that they wouldn't have time to think about how miserable they were. And so that instead of pouring out their passions on the miserable lot in life, they'd get on the side of the red team or the green team or whatever and just pour all that stuff out there, okay? But the Lord spoke to me and said, the bread and circuses are shut down. And then as for the church, I mean, look, we take for granted something and that is what we've had and this is one of the greatest things about uh, our nation i think anyway a long time ago a french guy named de tocqueville toured our nation and to try to discover what made us so dynamic and, and powerful even back in its beginnings and he said i looked everywhere to see what the dynamic was was it the factories the voluntary organization and then he said but then i went into the churches we take for granted a church full of people praising God. It's downright good for you to stand in a congregation, lift your hands. The soul just goes right to the, so the core when we hear throwy voices. Holy God, we praise thy name. Lord of all, we bow before you. It's awesome, and it's been a great privilege. How great, so great. <clears throat> like everything that people do with blessings and privileges. So great, it's taken for granted. People just routinely just blow off the church or destroy the church or undermine the church or walk out of the church or treat the church like a restaurant. Well, I don't like that place anymore. I want to go find something else. You know, I, we need this program and that program. And basically what God has done is just shut all that down for the time being. Now, I pray to God to come back because it's one of the great joys of my life. But if you think about it, people set out a table week after week after week after week, and they perform a divine service, and people stand up and lead worship, and other people prepare the word, and it really is a tremendous blessing. And God is saying, you know, that could all be taken away, no problem. No problem whatsoever. I do believe that one thing that's going to come out of this, I'm almost ready to go to my text. I pray to God that backsliders will reconsider their ways and come back to God. I pray that people that used to know the joy of church and counted on it and probably said in the back of their mind, well, I can always go back if I want to. I pray that they will wake up and realize Everything could be taken away. I do believe we are at the very end, and these are the beginnings of birth pangs and sorrows and pains. And they're actually mild in comparison. We, he took away our entertainment. He took away March Madness. He took away the NBA. It's a big deal. He took away the, old, the, the casual ability to count on going into a church full of people and praise the Lord? <laughs> yeah. It's not a given. You don't, we don't have a right to that. And uh, so that's hit me that very hard. And I pray. Look, I'm going to tell you something before I go to my text. You'll never find another time in your whole life like now that people are thinking about their mortality. They're thinking about their soul. In fact, a good many of them are thinking about God. You may as well be bold and witness to whoever you can while you can. 
figure out ways to minister to people. Have ready, because you are the priests of the ministers, have ready a word in season. And if you run into your neighbor or something like that, don't have a casual, casual conversation, you know, how you doing for toilet paper and all that stuff. Let's talk real. Let's ask about people's souls. And let's really try to provoke people to see what's going on and to seek the Lord. You know, there's a scripture, seek ye the Lord while he can be found. Call upon him while he's near. And I pray that all of us will see that, and I pray that everyone watching will see that. Now, go to Luke 13, because this is a chapter he gave me. He's, Jesus has told me for the last few weeks, I don't know if you noticed or not, to just talk about Jesus and his teachings and parables and miracles. So I'm trying to be obedient to this. And one that really came to me with power this week is do Luke 13 is what I got. Now, let me just walk through it very, very, very... Uh, Easily here. There were present at that season some that told him that him is Jesus of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. Now it was brutal times back then, okay? People were actually worshiping God with blood sacrifices, and Pilate sent soldiers to get them and slaughtered them right there while they were praising and worshiping. And Jesus answering said, Do you suppose that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? You think that they were worse than everyone else? You think this just happened to them? Because, well, everyone kind of looked down on Galileans. That was called Galilee of the Gentiles. There were Gentile cities there. Galileans were rough, hillbilly-type people. And a lot of people, uh, especially in Judea, looked down on them as not really being true, pious Jews. And so Jesus said, you think they were worse and that's why they got slaughtered? And then he says, no, I tell you, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. This is a very, very strong word from Jesus. I mean, just think about it. Unless you repent, you'll perish. You too will. And he's right historically but this is timeless. This speaks today. He's right historically because I've often brought this point out. I think it's very important understanding the Gospels, especially the words of Jesus, that in history God sent Jesus and John the Baptist exactly 40 years before an absolute, the worst catastrophe that ever befell the Jewish people fell upon them in 70 A.D., there was a mid, more than a million Jews slaughtered, and that was a smaller population back then. And the world's slave markets were glutted with Jews. The temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was razed to the ground. And there was no Israel for 2,000 years. It's such a catastrophe, they never got over it. But one generation before, God sent his son and the forerunner to try to get the people ready for this. Now, you could tell by their preaching, too, by the way, how complacent the people were. This is what scares me, reminds me of our time. The people were so complacent, they had a theology. Look, as long as we are Jews, we are good with God. Nothing can bad will ever happen to us. I mean, all they had to do is study their own history, and they'd know that wasn't true. But they had that idea. So if you think about what John preached, especially... Uh, you think because you're children of Abram, God, uh, you're good? God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones. And it's true. We were the stones. We Gentiles were dead to God. But God has chosen to make us alive and bring us into the promise. But these people were so complacent, they had no idea what was coming. No imagination for it whatsoever. That's another subject for another time. But look... There, that's why Jesus and John are always preaching repentance. Now, before I go any further, I want to share with you something God shared with me that is a very simple definition of repentance. And by the way, the greatest breakthroughs I've ever made in my life as a Christian were by God giving me very simple definitions of words that permeate the Christian experience. And a lot of times we bring our 
baggage or our own definition into it and don't even realize it. It's all so human. For example, when I first became a Christian, a born-again Christian, every time I heard the word repent or read it in the Bible, I thought penance. You can see how I'd make that mistake. Well, what's penance? Well, that's a Catholic teaching that when you sin, it's not enough to ask God to forgive you. By the way, you can't even ask God to forgive you. You've got to go ask the priest. By the way, Catholic Church just announced in view of this plague that they're going to offer forgiveness of sins and plenary indulgence on as long as you meet certain conditions. No wonder John called it Mystery Babylon, mother of all harlots and abominations. What an abomination. The Catholic Church can't forgive anyone's sins. In fact, they better get forgiveness of their own. Only Jesus can forgive sins. But anyway, I heard penance. Penance means if you've sinned, then you, it's not enough to ask forgiveness. You have to go uh, to confession. A priest will assign you a religious work so that you can accomplish that and achieve expiation for your sins. This is an abomination. Jesus died for our sins. But Rome is a liar and a whore. Anyway, uh, unless you repent, you'll perish. The word repent, what's it mean? Well, let me give you a fourfold definition. First of all, let's just start with the English language. Repent is a compound word. Re means again. Pent means think. What are we calling on people to do when we challenge them to repent? We're calling on them to think again. Think again about what? Well, about the most important question of all. How can a man be right with God? See, this is the problem, and it's part of being a human to have worked out in your soul a plan of salvation. Humans are eternal people, so everyone has one, even atheists. One atheist died, he was very rich, and he left his uh, very explicit uh, instructions for his funeral. He said, look, he said, take my body and cremate it. Do not have a religious service, and above all, don't have anyone pray at my funeral. Take the cremains and spread them from one end of this earth to the other. Scatter them as far and wide as you can, especially dump them over the ocean. Basically, his plan of salvation is you die, you disintegrate, you're gone, and you don't even exist anymore. Now, what I call that is wishful thinking. If there's 8 billion people in the world, then every one of them has a plan of salvation. And here's the problem. Most of them are wrong. And if you're wrong about that, that is the worst disaster that can ever befall you. If you are wrong, if you don't got it straight, the way of salvation. Unless you repent, you'll perish. That's another word that's very, very nice sounding. I mean, I heard parish. I thought, well, we, we belong to a parish. St. Ludmilla's Church is a parish. And that's where I came from when, at the beginning. I didn't know a thing. Now I found out the word perish means you will be ruined forever. Ruined. I mean, we were made like we sang today. The reason I live is to worship you. What if you are ruined for the reason you live? Forever. And then Jesus brought up a, a current event. Those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, you think they were sinners above all the men that dwell in Jerusalem? Oh, there was a construction accident. You know, they had news then just like we have news now. Construction accident in Siloam. A tower collapsed on people and 18 people were killed. He says, you think they're worse than you are in Jerusalem here? You think that they're worse sinners? Is that it? I tell you, he said, nay. But unless you repent... All of you will perish. All of you. Now, the thing is about it, <laughs> one, one of the things that he's warning them about is uh, missing the true meaning 
of current events. And I believe in the name of God that I'm standing here in Jesus' name to do the very same thing. As another scripture says, wisdom cries out in the streets every day. And that's the way I think, and that's the way I've been thinking, and I do believe the Lord has directed that, that um, uh, what is the real meaning of the closing down of the NBA? An almost impossible to conceive of thing to happen. I mean, there's no way. There's too much money, too much fame, too much glory, too much adoration of it. How is it that it closes down in a day? Okay. What is the meaning of every restaurant in this country virtually closing down? What is the meaning of one of the distinguishing marks? Believe it or not, you may think that we're bad off, and, and, and our country is. It's very sinful. But you ought to see the rest of the world. One of the distinguishing marks of this country at any time on Sunday morning, you will see churches full of people. People flocking into churches. It's true. How could that get shut down in a day? Now, like I say, I'm not going to concern myself with the human element, which is very nefarious, or even the demonic element. But those aren't independent. Always God is working. And what I believe those are is what's called portents. Signs of something coming. I believe that when the tower collapsed and the people, they were supposed to think this way. Wow. Anytime we could go. I wonder if I'm ready. But instead they thought this way. Oh, yeah, these construction workers, probably not pious, not sold out to God like we are. Jesus and John the Baptist flew in the face of that kind of presumption. Lest you repent, you'll perish. Now, the second meaning of repentance. Did I hear an angel? All right. Um, metanoia. Metanoia. Another compound word, only it's in Greek, but that's what is often translated in the Bible, metanoia. And it's very close to the word paranoia. You guys know what paranoia is. Just because you're paranoid, it doesn't mean they're not out to get you. All right. <laughs> Meta means change. Noia means your mind. What are we calling on people to do when we tell them to repent? Change your mind. I mean, it's really, really, really simple. In fact, one of the simplest and most beloved parables of Jesus, in my view, and I love them all, but some I love more than others. It's a very, very, very simple parable. Jesus said, a man had two sons, and he sent them out into the field to work. And the first one said, yes, Father, I will go. And he promptly turned around and went fishing. And the second one said, no, Father, I'm my own man now. I don't have to do what you tell me to do. But then as he walked away, Jesus said he changed his mind. How can I treat my father that way? How can I be such an ungrateful son? And he went and did the work. And Jesus said, which one do you think did the will of his father? Well, it's the one that changed his mind. Like I used to think, up and, I swear up and down, look, if you do enough good deeds, they will outweigh your bad deeds. And that's your only hope. I mean, I didn't even have a hope of going to heaven. My highest goal was just to get to purgatory. Okay. That was my plan of salvation. And then when I read the gospel of Matthew, which hit me right between the eyes, it smacked me so hard it made me change my mind. No purgatory. There's only two options, heaven or hell. And by the works of the flesh, it says in Romans, no man will be justified. And so I changed my mind. I, I, I went from your good deeds will outweigh your bad to Jesus, you're my only hope. You died for my sins. Now, I hope that I'm talking to someone today out there, too. 
Jesus loves you. He died for your sins. He's your only real hope. The great song, we don't sing it enough. Just as I am without the one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Only Jesus and his blood. I used to ask people in evangelism this question. If you were to die right now and the Holy God should say to you, why should I let you into my holy heaven? What would your answer be? And you always get a lot of answers that are basically man-centered. You know, I think he should let me in because I'm a very patient, loving person. I love animals and all this other stuff. And none of those are sufficient. But then one day I did hear someone who gave me the right answer right away. He said, he shouldn't. A holy God should not let me into his holy heaven knowing me. But if he does let me into his holy heaven, it'll only be because of one reason. Christ died for our sins once and for all, the just for the unjust. See, you got you to gotta change your mind. And we got to get people to change their mind. That's what makes evangelism very difficult. You got to get people to change your mind. You got to get them to see that their plan of salvation won't work. And if they die in it, I mean, this is the worst disaster that could ever happen to you if you die in your sins and if you're ruined forever. Now, I could go to the Hebrew because the Hebrew Bible talks a lot about repentance. It's the word teshuva. Teshuva. And it says that um, in the last days, Israel will return and come back to the land. Now, how many of you know that we're already starting to see that happen since 1948? Israel actually returned. They were from the ends of the earth, scattered there like Moses said they'd be. But in the last days, God has done something so great. He is bringing them back to the land. They return. But there's two meanings of return. Physically, they've returned. But there's a deeper meaning, which the same prophet, it's, it's actually Hosea, says, Then shall they return and worship David, their king, which is shorthand for Jesus. You see, there's a turning around physically, but the most important one is the turning around spiritually and morally. This is what uh, history is waiting for. The climax of history is the repentance of Israel. And then the last meaning is to change your affections, to love what you once avoid it like the plague and to hate what you once loved now i have a sad confession to make how i loved sin i loved it otherwise i wouldn't have done it <laughs> I, I loved it <laughs> but then something beautiful happened it's one of the signs of salvation when you really get saved then you start hating sin and you start loving what you used to avoid i used to think you know don't want to hear any preaching. Don't want anyone to witness to me. Don't want, you know, my wife t told me when she was a young girl, she didn't even know a thing about him. But anytime Billy Graham would come on the TV, she'd, ah, no, 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 no. What was that? A sin. It makes you love all the wrong things and hate the right things. But when you get converted, your affections change. Now, let me go on because, see, I believe that this subject of repentance is the whole meaning of this chapter, or at least the first three quarters of the chapter. So let me just walk through a few other things, parts of this. He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and he found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why should it cumber the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Now, I believe that the parables of Jesus usually have one great idea running right down through them. So that's the way to understand it. You don't want to force too much out of it, okay? Uh, he's warning the nation, which, by the way, the symbol for Israel is... Uh, the, the vineyard and the fig tree. Like there's a lot of vineyard parables and there's fig tree parables. This one combines them both. The vineyard and the fig tree. The fig tree is the good life. 
So is the vineyard. In fact, twice in the Old Testament, the prophets talked about the good life that God would give the Jews. Every man under his own vine, every man under his fig tree. And what a vision, right? What a beautiful vision. I once stayed with a very poor man in Russia, Krasnodar. And he had almost nothing, but he was rich in a way. Because out the back of his shed or whatever it was he lived in, he had an arbor and he had grown conquered grapes. And basically he would hold court out there under these grapes and you could smell them. It just smelled so heavenly, so beautiful, and cool in the hot sun. And I thought of that verse, every man under his vine, every man under his fig tree. Well, in the, the, in the Bible, there were laws about vines and fig trees. You could not destroy them in war. You weren't supposed to. It's what they point to. And you could, uh, you know, Israel is a very rocky place, so it's not easy to get a, either one going. You have a lot of cultivation, a lot of preparation. You gotta move the rocks out, you gotta bring in the dirt, you gotta protect it from the foxes. And uh, like that, uh, the original vineyard parable is Isaiah 5. My loved one planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and built a vine fan. That's Israel, okay? So Jesus is saying, well, now we go back to the vineyard. He actually planted a fig tree in the middle of the vineyard. And every single year he'd come looking for fruit. And after three years, nothing. And he said, why should it even take up any more ground? Now, here's the question. What is the fruit? Well, I believe it comes down to a very simple, a threefold thing, because they're all basically of the same. What does God want after so much preparation? Okay. So much care. Getting the rocks out, putting up a fence. I think of my own life. Why? Why was I born here in America where you could go to church any day of the week? Where when I was a kid, my mother would buy me little arch books. Where my mother and father, they didn't, they didn't have everything perfect, but they told me there was a God, there was a heaven, there was a hell. They also threw in purgatory, but they didn't know. I became very God conscious at a very young age. What's all this preparation for? Well, he's looking for faith. And when I say faith, I mean real faith. Not just mental assent. I mean truly clinging and cleaving to the Lord and truly loyal to God. And love, I mean true love. Love that's centered on God and that extends to everybody else. And you can't have either of those without this fruit. Repentance. When will they turn? Now, he says, Don't, why should it take up the ground anymore? Well, that's a valid question. What right do we, why, why, why do I want a, a, a fruit, fruitless fruit tree? Taking up my ground, they, you know, ground is at a premium in Israel. They, they had divvied it up a long time ago. You, you didn't have unlimited amounts of ground. Why should it even take up the ground? And he says, cut it down. Now, guess what? This is a warning to the nation of Israel. This is the Messiah 30 year, 40 years before 70 AD. It's a warning to him. Now there's another figure in this parable that comes in prominently. We don't know his name, but I think we know the name of the one it points to. The gardener. The gardener is the only person that comes between the ax at the root of the tree and total destruction of the tree. He says, no, 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 don't, don't cut it down yet, master. Let me work with it. Let me dung it and fertilize it. And then, it's not limitless. And then, if after that, there's no fruit, well, of course, cut it down. Remember John the Baptist preaching? The ax is already laid to the root of the tree. 
It's the, the axeman's out there now. <laughs> what are they saying? Oh, we're the Lord's fig tree. As long as we're Jews, we're good. But the only one that got between the axe and the tree is the gardener. The only reason they're still in America is Jesus. I believe that with all my heart. Is Jesus Christ. But it doesn't go on forever. That's what verse 9 teaches. Well, just another year. There's only so much time. By the way, I want to say something else while I still can. We are so close to the rapture now. And the second coming of Jesus. Call me crazy. I don't care. We are very, very near the Lord. The judge is at the door. And that's what these latest things are just portents of. Well, let me go on. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. See, everything in this is put together for a reason. There's a lot of things you could write about Jesus. But the gospel writers had theological burdens. And this chapter is about repentance. So, let's see. There was, behold, there was a woman that had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years, and was bowed together, and could in no wise lift up herself. So there is a woman in the synagogue, very, very bent over, humiliated, humbled, and suffering. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you're loosed from your infirmity. So within, within the congregation of Israel, this is attested to by all the Old Testament prophets and stories. There's always two congregations, two women. It's just like Jacob had two wives. Or the mother of Samuel was the forsaken wife, and the other one was fruitful. And it says, uh, more shall be the children of the, de the barren woman than of her that had many children. There's always two. There's one that is just um, usually portrayed as unbelieving, and one that is truly, truly devoted to God. Now, Jesus really did this miracle, but it's also... A symbolic action. He goes to someone in the congregation and sets them free. Someone that everyone else knew. You are loosed from your infirmity. And I've heard that. And so have you. That's, it's called the salvation of freedom. Praise the Lord. But And then that becomes a test for everyone else. How they can react. He laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. She couldn't stop praising God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because the Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said to the people, Now there are six days in which men ought to work, and those therefore come and be healed, not on the Sabbath day. Now, what is his problem that he could see a miracle of mercy which causes the people that really love God to praise God and he gets indignant and why is this story here because what this story tells us is the state of the synagogue and the gap between what God really esteems and what the synagogue thinks is important now Luke uh, will tell us in I won't have you turn there in chapter 16. The things which man esteems are an abomination to God, but the things which God esteems man revolts against. And here's a great example of it. <laughs> She's been set free. This woman has suffered. Jesus made her free. Hey, wait a minute. It's the Sabbath. What are you doing on the Sabbath? You're working on the Sabbath. What? It didn't happen overnight. There were Jews that died under Antiochus Epiphanes rather than violate the Sabbath because he made laws that try to force them to violate the Sabbath. They said, go ahead and kill us. We won't. It's, it's our sign between us and God. It's loyalty. Sabbath is wonderful. And they would die rather than violate the Sabbath. But what happened? Well, over the centuries, uh, they'd, they'd have questions. Rabbi, what is uh, work? And the rabbi would uh, say, well, work is if you pick up seven pounds, not, but not six. So you can pick something up six pounds, not seven. And how far can I walk on Sabbath? If, and 
uh, and it not be work. That's where you get the expression, Sabbath day's journey. Now, guess what? I'll just sum this up. By the time these centuries had elapsed, which is not that many, a couple of them, you have the Sabbath law as one of the Ten Commandments. The rabbis had concocted 1,200 sub-laws governing the Sabbath. Now, by the time they were done with it, you were so glad when the next day came and you were done with the Sabbath. Wouldn't you say they, got, they missed the point? As Jesus said, Sabbath, man wasn't made for Sabbath. Sabbath is made for man. <laughs> But they had destroyed the word of God. And they had loaded the people down with a burden, like this woman with a spirit of infirmity. And they had missed the whole point. And what, what this shows us is the state of the synagogue, the congregation, how far they really had grown from God. And how God sees something and how his people see it. So this guy is saying, it's the Sabbath, you're not to work. Now what is he doing? Well, Jesus tells us in the next verse, he's pretending. Then Jesus, the Lord answered him and said, notice it says the Lord. The Lord answered him them and said, you hypocrite. Well, let me explain what hypocrite is. It's often used in the Bible. And you want to get it right. A hypocrite is a play actor. They pretend. What do they pretend? Well, in this case, he's pretending that he's totally, totally devoted and loyal to God. Or they pretend that they are something they're not, or they pretend that they're not something that they really are. You hypocrite. And then he points out the hypocrisy. So doesn't each of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? Rabbi, if my ox gets caught in a ditch, can I get him out on the Sabbath? Rabbi comes with, with a ruling. It comes right out, of, you know, I'm sure Bible study and everything. Yes, of course, Sabbath, but you can still get your ox out. You don't want your ox to die just because of Sabbath law. Now Jesus says, oh, really, an ox is more important than a fellow human being? A woman bowed down with the spirit of infirmity? You can't rejoice? Ought not this woman, verse 16, being a daughter of Abram, whom Satan has bound, lo, these 18 years, on she be loosed? From this bond on the Sabbath, isn't that a good thing? And when he said these things, verse 17 is interesting. All his adversaries were ashamed. And all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done for them. Done of them. Now let me move along. So, the parable of the mustard seed is also in the same train of thought. Verse 18, then said he, under what is the kingdom of God like? What is the rule of God really like? Where unto shall I resemble it? Oh, here's what it's like. It's like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his garden. And it grew and waxed a great tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. Okay, now look, I'm gonna tell you a story of my own. We had a, I think it was a Jerusalem lily or some kind of beautiful bush that was very flowering up in front of the house there. And uh, I loved it and Chris loved it. And one day I'm looking at it and there is a huge branch coming out of it. It just didn't look right. And then I realized that's a mulberry tree growing right next to it. <laughs> in other words, how much of that tree was that tree? That's the meaning of this parable. How much of the synagogue, or we could say the church, are real? He predicted in Matthew 13, there will be an unnatural growth. It won't be real. And, and he put that alongside the parable about the bread with the leaven. Look, mustard is a herb. Now I've been told since I preached this one time, someone says, no, there is a mustard seed tree. Okay, fine. But how much of it? It says the birds of the air lodge in the branches. What's he saying there? The synagogue is not all full of people that are real with God. 
In fact, there's a lot of demons there. Remember in Mark 1, Jesus cast out a demon, his first demon in Mark. Guess where he found him? In the synagogue. What have we to do with you, Jesus, son of God? I'm sure the people that heard that thought, what? I've known this guy for 20 years. I've never heard him talk that way. The kingdom of God is like a lump of dough. And they make these breads out of dough. And usually the bread is flat. And what you see is what you get. A pound of dough makes a big, big cake, but it's flat. Whom a woman came and put three measures of yeast in it, leaven. Leaven's corruption. So what happened? Well, the dough got really, really big. You think, wow, I'm used to these little flat dough loaves are probably about a pound of bread. This must be 10 pounds of bread. Well, if you put it on the scale, it's still just one pound of bread. How much of the bread is bread? Only one pound. What did the leaven do? Puffed it up. It's part of what God's doing with his church is popping the puffing and humbling us. Oh, he, yeah, right here. Where unto shall I liken the kingdom of God? It's like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the hall was leavened. Oh, it's secret. She, she worked it in. The woman did. What woman? Well, that's another story. One of the themes that runs all through the Bible, especially Proverbs, Revelation, all through the Bible. Two women. Proverbs is a great example. Remember, it's about you hope the king's son marries the right woman. And you hold your breath because right away in Proverbs chapter 2, a slick, smooth-talking, flattering woman steps on the stage. Or like Proverbs 7, man, is she ever gorgeous. And the simple is wandering the streets. And she runs out and gives him a kiss and says, I'm waiting for you. I mean, what young single man, young man, wouldn't want to be flattered by a beautiful woman? And so it says it all happens in, uh, I love the poetry of Proverbs, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, she kissed him. Before he can even think. I mean, sometimes events hit people, especially naive people, like deer in the headlights. What, what just happened? Oh, don't worry, I'm Christian. But she didn't say that. She said it in the Old Testament way. I've paid my vows. I've made my sacrifice. In other words, you can take me home to mom. And then what did she say? Oh, but let me tell you about my bedroom. <laughs> you cannot believe the, the delights that are there. What? That's the woman who took the leaven, who worked it into the loaf so that you can't tell how much is real. It's like it says in, in Romans, not all Israel is Israel. Well, that's the same of the church. That's the woman, the harlot. And it says that she uh, took him to slaughter. He didn't know when he followed her. She forced him, it said. Well, no, I always picture some really nice, slight slip of a cutie and some big, huge, hulking country boy. But she forced him, not with physical strength, with the power of her femininity, until a dart strikes through his liver and he's gone. Now, this is the woman that Jesus is saying to the synagogue and to Israel. And this is timeless. This is New Testament to the church. There's a bride that's real. You're so happy by the time you get to the end of Proverbs. Why? The son chose the right one. He found the bride. He escaped the harlot. What's going on in the world now? Two kinds of churches. The real and the fake. 
the sincere and the flattering. Now, let me move on because I've taken longer than I thought, but I think this is uh, really significant to at least get to this point. He says, um, 23, this is all the same subject. It's about repentance. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that will be saved? See, they're listening to Jesus' teaching and they're beginning to realize something. Are you saying that very few people be saved? Now, i got to admit, that went against my expectation, too. I mean, I, if you would have asked me when I was first saved, hey, does Jesus talk about heaven or hell more? I would have said heaven without hesitation because in my view, t touched by humanism, everything Je about Jesus is positive. It's good. It's uplifting. It's encouraging. It's bold. It's love. It's all. But one day I thought, well, you know, I better fact check myself. Now, this is even before Google, but I was way ahead of my time. And I fact my check myself by going through Matthew and counting. And I quit about halfway through. But Jesus talks so much more about hell in the most frightening terms than he ever did about heaven. And I think I understand now why. Jesus is not dealing with blank slates. In the human race, he's dealing with fallen people with fallen inclinations that are already in deep trouble and they're already slipping. And at any point, even if you do rescue them, they're liable to go defect and fall back into the pit again. So he is warning us. Are there just a few that are going to be saved? Well, listen to what he says. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. The narrow, narrow passage. The word strive is agonizomai. Wrestle. Well, who are you wrestling against? Well, I'm wrestling against my lusts. I'm wrestling against my inclinations. I'm wrestling against the world. I'm wrestling against the fear of man. There's a lot of opposition there. He says, what he says in answer is, you do whatever you have to do to get through that. For I say to you, many will seek to enter in. They won't even be able to. When once the master of the house has risen up, and this is where we're getting to that point, the master is standing up and has shut the door. When the Lord shuts the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he'll answer and say, I don't know where you came from. Now, Jesus is still warning the nation in his day. And what's he saying? Look, the door's about ready to shut. I mean, once the Romans put up a siege around Jerusalem, it's pretty much over. They had no idea. They were listening to false prophets, just like people listen to false prophets now. They had no idea what was coming. I mean, our false prophets are just as plentiful as theirs. And you'll say, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he'll answer, I don't know where you came from. Then she begin to say, wait, we ate and drank in thy presence. You taught in our streets. Well, a lot of people take communion. A lot of them do. When I was a Catholic, I took Eucharist, is what we call it. Every single week, we take Eucharist. We took a lot of stock in that. We thought that was it, salvation. And uh, then he says, uh, you taught in our streets. Well, a lot of people are very familiar with Jesus' words. There's not a politician around that at some point or other isn't citing Jesus as if he's his best friend. <laughs> uh, then she began to say, we ate and drank in thy presence. You taught in our streets. But he'll say, I tell you, I don't know where you come from. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. See, it's still the same theme. Unless you repent. Unless you change your mind. See, what do they need to change their mind about here? Well, we're familiar with his teaching. We get it. And we, we, we eat in his presence all the time. Yes, but you're not ready. Some of these people, they weren't saved. They weren't right. And they didn't know how close judgment was. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. And you yourself thrust out. And they'll come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. And they'll sit down in the kingdom of God. What's he saying there? You cannot believe who's going to get there before you. 
You can't believe the people that you despise. I mean, we're, we're going to be so blown away in heaven. People from the Muslim world, people from black Africa, and dark practices, superstition, people from the communist, atheistic world. Who God is speaking to people everywhere. The greatest, the greatest growth of the church in the world right now is Iran. Muslim Iran, where if you get saved, you're liable to die. It's not stopping them. And behold, there are last which shall be first. Now, there's so much more that I could say, but I think I've said everything I'm supposed to say today. So I'd like to pray for you and for everybody. My Lord, I pray that if this message is just for one person to repent, or else if it's for all of us to be able to teach other people to repent, what are we asking people to do when we tell them they need to repent? Well, they need to change their mind. They need to think again about what they thought they knew. They need to turn around. They need a change of affections. Father, let us be effectual because you said in Peter, and I, this is where I close, uh, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise of some men count slackness. But God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you and God bless you. Hang in there, keep praying. Have home fellowships too. Praise God.